Now, please again, don't laugh, because this is again another one of my things that I'm very proud of. This is my car. Those are little birds that I drive. You like my birds? OK, and that's the sun. My, my daughter helped me drive that. But anyway, this is my car. This is to tell you the other thing that I like about biodiesel and running your car on vegetable oil. OK, I'm driving along in my car. I'm putt-putting. I'm running, on, I'm running biodiesel, running on waste vegetable oil. They're the same. I'm just saying I'm running on vegetable oil, OK? And what happens? Well, as I'm going, isn't that cool? Uh, out of the back comes CO2, okay? CO2 is bad, right? CO2 is really bad. It causes global warming. Okay, I've been lying to you the whole time. No, I haven't. CO2 goes up there. It hangs out in the environment long enough to Al, for Al to make movies about it and everybody to get upset about it and everybody to think about it. And then what happens is I go, hey, I need some more oil. Well, actually, before I do that, I'm sorry, Farmer Brown plants a crop of, say, corn or whatever, and it sequesters that same amount of CO2 into the crop because it needs it to grow. Then I take that. Turn it, someone takes it and turn it into oil. I put it in my car, it goes back into my car, and generally speaking, I have what's called a closed loop system. I'm basically not adding any CO2 to the environment. I'm just sort of, I'm kind of borrowing it, putting it back out there, borrowing it, putting it back out there. This is the exact same closed loop, by the way, as petroleum. The only difference is this takes a growing season, and petroleum takes 150 million years. So it's not really a great closed loop, but eventually it's going to go back. Anybody who's read uh, After We're Gone, if you've read that book, so it sort of talks about it. It's kind of a cool book. Just to give you a little quick thing, this is my car, which I like and, and school kids seem to like. It's kind of a cool little fun car to drive. It gets 45 miles to the gallon, by the way, because diesels get better gas mileage than, than gasoline cars. This is actually the uh, tank that I put in my spare tire area. Everybody always says, what happens if you have a flat? I don't even know the last time anybody had a flat, but I have Better Worlds, which is sort of an environmental AAA. So. And if I go on a long trip, I put it in the back there. Uh, this is me being very confused and trying to put it into the car. Um, this is a little filter that filters it out and heats it. This is actually something called a solenoid that switches. There are two of them. They switch back and forth. Um, this is me trying to figure out how to put the hose inside, because like I said, I'm not a mechanic, and I generally look that dorky when I'm at home. Um, and this is my engine afterwards. So I put in all these little uh, what's it's and thingies and whatnot. These are the two solenoids. This is the heated filter. And then these go to the trunk and through the engine, and they have coolant in them to heat it up. So while this may look really, really confusing, and it totally was to me, I was able to do this on my own. Why? Because I really, really wanted to do it, and I wanted to figure it out. And there are books, and I have links to it, so there's ways to go. Having said all of this, just having said biodiesel and waste vegetable oil and biofuels and all this great stuff, I'm here to tell you that, personally speaking, I think that what I'm doing is wrong. And I'm saying on a larger level. Why? Because very simplistically, food should be grown to feed people, not feed cars. This is what I'm doing in the meantime, because I don't want to be part of the petroleum cycle. I want to get out of that as soon as I can. I will be buying not one of these, because I don't make enough money, but an electric car. Has anybody seen this? The all electric Tesla Roadster. This is a $100,000 sports car. Tesla made a $100,000 sports car because they want to sell it to rich and famous people and get it out there, and, and that's just their, their model. But they will be making, this is an all-electric car, by the way. I've been in this. This is the most unbelievable vehicle you will ever see in your life. It's incredible. I was actually standing in the engine bay. I wrote an article about it. Um, and they said, put your arms out like this. And I put my arms out. And I felt this thing. And I opened my eyes. And I said, what is this? And he said, that's the, uh, that's the, that's the motor. And I was holding the 70-pound motor that could fit in my backpack in my hands. They're the most simple elegant, wonderful cars you can imagine. And they're going to be making them down to the $15,000 price level within 15 years. Their hope is to actually increase national security by making affordable electric cars. So this is coming. Now, most people say to me, but there's two things about electric cars I have a problem with, Dave. Why are we going to make more energy to make electric cars? That doesn't make sense. We already have a problem with the grid, right? Everybody kind of thinks that. Well, the, uh, the uh, NRDC did a study a while back, and I think there have been a couple since that have supported this, that if 80% of all of the cars on the road in the United States today, if you could snap your finger and make them electric, we would need to make not one more watt of power. Why? Because, and I don't completely understand this other than conceptually, big power generators don't have an on-off button. <laughs> they, they work all day, and they generate power, and they generate power, and they generate power, and they generate power, and then at night, they kind of pull them back a little bit, but they can't turn them off. It has something to do with, I think it takes like a week to get them back online, or you're shaking your head. So. 
maybe energy, and I think it destroys them, or something like that. But it's not good, and they don't do it. So what do they do? They dump all of this electricity at night. Everybody, everybody here who has a house and probably people who have an apartment know that they tell you to run your dishwasher at night, run your, you know, the, and they charge you less for it. Well, there's two reasons for that. One is they want to ease, ease stress on the grid during the day when it's hot and when other problems are coming. But the other thing is they've got all this energy they're chucking out the window, and they're like, well, let's make something off of it. Let's convince people to use it now and make less money. So 80% of the cars could be electric, and we wouldn't need any more energy. Now, 100%, sure, but that gives us a lot of time to sort of figure out those other problems. The other thing is everybody goes, well, what about the batteries? The batteries are a problem. There's no question about it. Um, lithium batteries are getting much better. If companies like Tesla, you actually pay, I think, $5,000 in their price to, that's earmarked and already given to a recycler so that when your battery is done, it's given to the recycler and it's 100% recycled. Very soon, hopefully within the next five years or so, and I can't tell you more than this because it's proprietary information, there's going to be something out, coming out uh, that's, that's generally spoken of as an ultracapacitor. And these are lighter, more efficient, get more miles, you name it. They're going to have cars that run on ultra capacitors that basically you can go two, 300 miles in. You can plug in while you get a cup of coffee and go another two, 300 miles in. The ultra capacitors will last for a million miles, and they are completely 100% recyclable, and even some of them are biodegradable. This is the future, and there's no question about it, and we need to embrace it. Another thing about this is it's much easier to kill, to, uh, clean up a million tailpipes, uh, I'm sorry, it's much harder to clean up a million tailpipes than it is one generating station that's stationary. Another car just sort of more in regular people's price range, this is called the Aptera. It's going to be out in a little while. I've actually seen this car. It plugs into house power. This is going to be under $30,000. They're making a hybrid version, which is going to get 300 miles per gallon. And they're making an electric version, which is 120 miles. You know, the other thing that I hear from people is like, oh, but it only goes 250 miles where I have to charge it up overnight. You can't drive to Vegas, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can have driving to Vegas at the drop of a hat, which you never do anyway because your wife won't let you and I won't go into that. <laughs> but, <laughs> or you can have wars in the Middle East and problems with the environment and problems with pollution and whatever. I look at both of those and go, I really like Vegas, but I gotta go with the other one on this, you know? I mean, and they're gonna get better. So this is where it's like, we have to accept some little tiny inconveniences. And I'll, what I also tell people is, you know what? Buy an electric car, the money you're going to save, rent a limo and go to Vegas for the weekend, the gas limo, you know, have someone drive you, you'll save money, 